It's a pleasure to be before you once again. I'm thankful for the opportunity to do so. If you would be turning to the book of Daniel, chapter 2, this will serve as our text this morning. We'll be spending quite a bit of time there. Daniel chapter 2. Before we do get into our text, I would like for us to consider a couple other verses to keep us in the right frame of mind, if you will, to consider this lesson in light of these verses. We must note from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, that the church of Christ has been in the mind of God since before the creation of our physical world. That passage there says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, it has been the plan to establish the church of Christ, the spiritual body of the saved. It has always been the plan. Part of the design and the plan was the specific time which this church was to be established. We have recorded for us in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. The fullness of time was come. You see, there was a correct time for our Savior, Jesus the Christ, to come in the flesh. He came into this world at the exact time prescribed by God. This particular time would be the most beneficial for man as a race. <clears throat> Thus, God's plan would be most easily, if you want to look at it that way, accomplished on earth. We must realize that mankind as a race had to progress in time via technology, different economies, agriculture, the ability for us to exchange information, health, etc. All these different things had to progress for mankind. It was this time that was prophesied by Daniel of old. Now we see from our text, again in Daniel chapter 2, that King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. We also see that none of his magicians his astrologers, sorcerers, or Chaldeans could even tell the meaning of the dream. They could not even provide what happened in his dream. Inspiration does record for us his dream. Again, Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 through 35. Thou, O king, sawest, behold, and behold, a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote that image became a great mountain and filled the whole, the whole earth. What I would like for us to do this morning is to discuss this passage in light of the two passages we read prior, that is Ephesians chapter 3, 
verses 9 through 11, as well as Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Our first point of consideration will be the first kingdom, and that is the Babylonian Empire. Daniel chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. We have Daniel telling the king the interpretation of his dream. And here we find him explaining the different aspects of this terrible image. He says, this is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the earth, or fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler, ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. <clears throat> We're going to do this with the different kingdoms. I would like to give a, a brief history regarding each of them, beginning with Babylonian Empire. Babylonia referred once to more of an ancient cultural region in Mesopotamia. This area extended from modern-day Baghdad, Iraq, to the, per the Persian Gulf. We find in secular history that this area was first settled supposedly around 4000 B.C. <coughs> However, we must note that Babylon would not be a significant political power until roughly 1850 B.C. The ruler largely responsible for this rise in power was Hammurabi, which I have no doubt many of us have heard throughout our, our lessons within history, perhaps school. He developed the Code of Hammurabi, a codified law, who reigned between 1792 and 1750 B.C. Now his death eventually brought about the decline of the Babylonian Empire, but after 400 years, a series of wars erupted and eventually brought to rise Nebuchadnezzar the first. This is about 1119 to 1098 BC. Assyrian kings would reign over the Babylonian area for several centuries. Ashurbanipal would be the, the last Assyrian king to rule over Babylon in this area. Now once he died, Nabopolassar, a Chaldean leader, declared that Babylon would be his capital city for this empire, and thus instituted the last and greatest period called the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Eventually, this man's son, Nebuchadnezzar II, would come to power, roughly 605 to 562 B.C. This is the Babylonian king we find in Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar II as history would refer to him as. This Nebuchadnezzar would go on to conquer Syria and Palestine. He is best known for the destruction of Jerusalem and the following captivity of the Jews. Now why does any of this matter? <clears throat> Rex, Turn Rex Turner Sr. has a book called Daniel a prophet of God, which we'll be referencing throughout this sermon, has this to say regarding the Babylonian Empire and their influence on the phrase, the fullness of time. As a ruler, Nebuchadnezzar served a purpose given by God, which Rex Turner describes as follows. True enough, Nebuchadnezzar was designated the head of gold, that is, head of the Babylonian Empire. But more than this, he was specifically and providentially chosen by God to punish his people, that is, God's people, the Hebrews, on the one hand, and to prepare Nebuchadnezzar's people for the coming of Christ on the other hand. Now, as a nation, the head of fine gold, the Babylonian Empire, the chief contribution of this empire was the Jewish synagogue. The Babylonian power in a period of three dispersions 
had carried Bab- or carried to Babylon all the people except the very poorest of the land. The direct result of the forcible dispersing of the Jews into Babylon was that in turn the Jews began to meet in small groups and those private meetings gave rise to the synagogue order of worship. When Christ came upon the scene of action centuries later, the the synagogues were quite prevalent throughout the entire Roman world, and those synagogues served as stepping stones or launching boards for the rise and growth of the church, which church had its beginning on the first Pentecost following the death of Christ. The apostles went first to the Jews or Jewish synagogues to proclaim the risen Christ. That synagogue contribution was naturally incorporated into the next world order. So we know that the synagogue was a house of worship. They contained a main sanctuary for assembly and prayer. They also had several smaller rooms for study or what we would consider classes. At least ten Jewish men were needed to, quote, justify the use of a synagogue. Now, a man was considered a male 13 years and older. Thus, these synagogues provided a way for displaced Jews to worship God under the law of Moses, having no temple to worship Him under the law. They provided an easier means of access to teach the Jews the gospel of Christ looking forward to that dispensation. And these synagogues laid the groundwork for the concept of individual congregations of the Lord's church. Again, that was the image of gold, the Babylonian Empire. Following along with our text, Daniel chapter 2, the latter portion of verse 32, says his breast and his arms of silver. We find later in verse 39, the first part of that verse, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. So a second kingdom would eventually overthrow this head of gold. This second kingdom refers to the Medo-Persian Empire. We see that this empire was prophesied about in scriptures. Isaiah chapter 13, verses 17 through 20, it says that God would stir up the Medes. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 28 says that they would eventually overthrow Babylonia. We see throughout secular history that Media and Babylon were both vassal states to Assyria. As Assyria had declined in its power, Both of these vassal states refused to pay their taxes. We see then that Media and its allies would eventually overthrow Assyria. They would capture Nineveh, which was the Assyrian capital in 612 B.C. This would ultimately kickstart Media's growth into a world power. They grew from modern-day Iran to modern-day Turkey. And they eventually became one of four major empires in the ancient Near East, including Babylonia, Lydia, and Egypt. Now under King Cyaxerxes, Media became a united state. This king brought all the Iranian tribes together, which would include the Persians, the Parthians, and the Scythians. Cyaxerxes was then succeeded by his son, Astyages in 585 to 549 B.C. And eventually his grandson, Cyrus the Great, would become king of the Persians and rebel in 553 B.C. He would overthrow the Median control and eventually the Medes were subject then to the Persians, thus ushering in a period of the medo uh, the Medo. Persian Empire. Cyrus II, or Cyrus the Great, would go on to conquer Babylon in 539 B.C. We are given the reason why this was to occur. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 11. To avenge the temple of God. 
we find in Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, that the temporary king, Belshazzar, was using temple utensils for his feast of praise to their false gods. Period of debauchery. He was profaning these pure utensils that were dedicated to use in the temple of God. And we know how that account goes. This brought immediately the handwriting on the wall and eventually the death of Belshazzar. And then we see that Darius took over the kingdom. Daniel chapter 5, verses 25 through 31. The Medo-Persian Empire would go on to conquer Lydia, and as well as Egypt. It would eventually extend from modern-day India to parts of Egypt as well as Greece. It is interesting to note that this empire spanned over 2.1 million square miles. Following pattern, let us then consider the contribution of this country, this empire, regarding the phrase, the fullness of time. Again, referencing Rex Turner's book, the breast and arms of silver, the Medo-Persian Empire, the chief contribution of this world empire was its commitment to the principle of law and order. To illustrate, the law of the Medes and Persians altereth not was the prevailing spirit of government at that point in time. Unlike Nebuchadnezzar, who was above the law, Darius could not even rescue Daniel from the lion's den. Daniel chapter 6. To illustrate this point just a bit further, when Christ came upon the scene of action, there was an existence or in existence a reign of enforced law and order such as the world has never seen since. In short, the Medo-Persians' commitment to the principle and respect for law and order had come to be incorporated to a significant degree in the Roman Empire and made for a certain protection of men like Paul Barnabas, Titus, and Luke. Next, we would consider the third empire mentioned in Daniel chapter 2. That is the Grecian Empire. It's referred to as the belly and thighs of brass. Verse 39, the second part. And another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. We know this to be the Grecian Empire. We see that this empire began in roughly 1200 B.C. with the end of the Mycenaeans. Now, the Grecian Empire is more more considered a civilization rather than an organized country. They had cultural traits, they had religion, they had a common language, They had a basic political unit, which was the city-state, but they were not organized. There were several instances in their history that points to and shows that these city-states were rivals, and they would have conflicts between themselves. However, they they did behave like siblings in that regard. Whenever someone shown to be a common enemy, they would unite to try to defend this civilization. We see this in the Persian Wars. Throughout this period, however, ancient Greece would slip into what would would be called Dark Ages. However, it would emerge roughly 776 B.C. This period of time is referred to as the classical Greek period in history. It is interesting to note that this civilization was completely unified only one time and for only 13 years. This occurred under the rule of Alexander the Great, the years 336 to 323 B.C. We see that his power, his rise to power was prophesied in Daniel chapter 8, verses 3 through 9, as well as verses 20 and 21. This prophecy was fulfilled in 331 B.C. when Alexander the great defeated the Medes and the Persians under the rule of Darius III. After the deciding battle of Guagamala, he proclaimed himself to be the king of Asia. 
Later on, he would go on to conquer Tyre, Gaza, Egypt. And due to his, his troops refusing to fight any longer, must or he needed to stop short of conquering India. This period of ancient Greece was considered to have ended at his death in 323 B.C. We see from history that his power was then divided amongst his four generals. And once again, the political rule, the political power of Greece was divided. They also were able to provide a contribution for the church, the kingdom later on, the fullness of time. The belly of brass, the Grecian Empire, the chief contribution of this world empire was its Greek language, which came to be a nigh-universal language. Thus the saying, the Greeks have a word for it. When Christ came upon the scene of action, the Greek language was the best known and the most often spoken language in the Greco-Roman world. Though the Romans sought to enforce their Latin language upon the people, as a result of this contribution, the books of the New Testament, fortunately, were written in Greek, a language that was sufficiently versatile to allow for fine spiritual distinctions. This brings us to our fourth kingdom. Daniel chapter 2, verse 33, as well as verses 40 through 43. His legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. And verses 40 through 43. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to, the, uh, to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. History tells us that ancient Rome was founded around 753 B.C., at least according to tradition, Romulus was its first king. Rome was ruled by kings up until about 509 B.C. It is at this point that the Republic of Rome was founded. There were a series of civil wars and political conflicts that would continue to destabilize this Roman government. However, these wars eventually brought about the transition from a republic to the Roman Empire. Then, by 40, uh, 44 B.C., Julius Caesar is named Roman dictator for work he had already accomplished throughout his career. The Senate there gave him that title. And then Octavian, later given the title of Caesar Augustus, ruled as Rome's first emperor, 27 B.C. to year 14 A.D., there were several emperors that followed, Tiberius from 14 to 37 A.D., Gaius Germanicus, also known as Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. Rome would go on to have many other emperors. However, the unified empire would eventually end in 395 A.D., and you can read about the history regarding this empire, how it did in fact appear to be strong, but different factions occurred. The leadership would fluctuate, thus weaknesses would be exposed, further fulfilling the prophecy we just read in Daniel. And by 395 A.D., this ultimately brought about two factions, the Western Roman Empire, which will last until about 480 A.D., and the Eastern Roman Empire, which would go on to last until roughly 1453 A.D. Again, considering the contribution of this empire to the fullness of time, 
the legs of iron and the feet part of iron and part of clay, the Roman Empire. The chief contributions of this world empire were, for one thing, the contributions made by the three prior world empires, which were passed on to the Roman society. I would point out that they took what was already good and in, in useful and they made it better. So they funneled down the different aspects of the prior empires that they had conquered, implemented them and tweaked them, if you will, and tried to make them better, incorporated them into their own society. For a second thing, a world empire of good roads and free of customs, thereby providing for a, free, or for, for a freedom of travel and communication. For a third thing, a high standard of Roman citizenship, when Christ appeared upon the scene, the Roman Empire unwittingly provided a cradle or protectorate for the infant church. Paul and his contact with the Roman government is a striking case in point. As cruel as the Roman Empire was, it provided a lot of good things, especially for the infant church. Now we consider the fifth kingdom. Of Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king that what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. We know that this kingdom is the kingdom of God, also referred to as the church of God or church of Christ. This church was prophesied elsewhere in Scripture, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, as well as Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, and Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3. We also see that Jesus foretold its existence, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18, which reads, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some say Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. Now there are some that would go on to say that Peter is this rock upon which the church is built. But when you consider the meaning of words, we know that this is entirely false. The Greek word Peter there is Petros, which defined by vines is a detached rock or stone that might be thrown or easily moved. I don't know about you, but I don't want to build a house on a stone that is easily moved. Now contrast this against the term rock, which is Petra. According to vines once more, this denotes a mass of rock, a type of of a sure foundation. A sure foundation. We see here that Jesus promised to build His church. And it would be built upon the fact, not the assumption, not the thought, but the fact that He is the very Son of God, not Peter. And we know that not even the death of Christ would stop its establishment. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Ultimately, the church was established and it was being added to based upon those who should be saved. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. 
Turner again commenting on this, The expression in the days of these kings meant that in the days of the Roman kings, when the Caesars were the emperors of Rome, the God of heaven would set up a kingdom that would never be destroyed. The kingdom, or church, was set up on the first Pentecost following the death of Christ, which period of time was during the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the Roman emperor. Jesus Christ is the sovereign over his new kingdom, the church, and he shall remain as the sovereign king until he comes again, at which time he will deliver up the kingdom to God the Father. The sovereignty of the kingdom of God will never be in the hands of mortal men or man. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 through 28. We have noted this morning that the establishment of Christ's church has always been in the mind of God. It has always been His plan, His purpose to establish. He knew exactly when to have the second person of the Godhead put on flesh and into the world to begin this establishment. This allotted time was used for man to grow and develop as a race. Could God have established the church just after Adam and Eve sinned? He could have. But mankind would not have fully appreciated the church, appreciated all the things going behind it. Mankind had to develop as a race. You think about how far we've come in the last 200 years. You think of Louis Pasteur. It took his experiments for us to understand that there's a thing called germs. As a race, we didn't understand that. So we had to have dietary laws in place to keep specifically the Jews faithful to God, to keep them pure. Mankind as a, as a race was ignorant of a lot of different things. But through time, they would become enlightened, if you will. They would learn things. They would learn new technologies. They would grow and develop. We see this in our children. There's a time where we would expect them to stick a fork in an outlet, to be electrocuted. Hopefully they're okay. And then by the time they grow up, we don't expect that sort of thing from them anymore. We expect them to have learned. We expect them to be fully functional members of society. Now certainly there are methods of teaching that go along with that. But as a race... We started out as an infant. However, with the guidance of God's laws, here we are. We're much more advanced. We're much more able to appreciate all that God has done for us. We're able to appreciate the church itself and as a race to benefit the contributions of these different empires as foretold by Daniel the prophet. Now we have discussed these different kingdoms in prophecy and how they related to the kingdom of God that would be established, each of them showing, Daniel 4.17 in action, that God uses even the heads of governments to accomplish His will for our benefit, ultimately bringing about the perfect scenario for the church to be built and then added to. Any other institution that claims to save one's soul, that traces its beginning to a man or a woman, is not the kingdom of God. It does not fit the pattern. How many Medo-Persian empires were there? How many Babylonian empires were there? Grecian empires? Roman empires? There was only one of each. How many different bodies of law did each of these empires have as a resource to govern themselves? Only one. Thus, how many churches are acceptable to God today? Only one. How many sons of God are acceptable to God today? Only one. How many governing bodies of law are there that are acceptable to God today? Again, just one, and that is the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Now, the entry, the method of entry into this kingdom is the same as it was in the first century. If they sought to be faithful to God, they needed to hear God's word taught to them. They needed to build their faith in Christ as the Son of God, repent of their sins, confess Christ before others, and ultimately be baptized for the remission of sins. At that point, 
They were made citizens of this kingdom. They were Christians. That has not changed. If you wish to follow the pattern that God has set out for our salvation, you will follow those same steps. If you're not a Christian today, why not take those steps to be baptized in the name of Christ, our Savior, to receive remission of sins, ultimately becoming a Christian, and being added by our Lord to this church. Or, for those who have already become children of God, have you allowed sin back into your life? Have you gone astray? Sought after allegiance with another kingdom, that is, the kingdom of Satan. Why not put away that sin? Why not be restored this morning through repentance and prayer? Each of us must make it our life's work to apply Matthew chapter 6, 33. We must seek first God or His kingdom and His righteousness. Obedience is the key to being faithful. Without being faithful, we cannot expect heaven when this life is over. So each of, whichever of these needs applies to you this morning, please make it known as together we stand and sing.